first live TV performance of a group that had been hailed as the most controversial band since the Sex Pistols. We do have in the studio the Cocteau Twins. Sit back, hold tight, and enjoy the total noise and summer sounds. Here for the first time ever is my bloody Valentine. These are the Jesus and Mary Jane. Octo fever has hit, and guess who has it? You happen to drive down High Street about 7.30 this evening, you might have seen some people unlike most you normally see on Columbus streets. What we are at and what you're about to see is the Cocteau Twins, a concert here. This is one of the top bands in England. Critics say that this band is going to be influencing mainstream rock and roll music for years to come, but right now it's fair to say that they are a favorite of the underground set. Purely by chance, I wouldn't say it was by design or whatever, but we seem to have come up with a style of music that, you know, gave people a, a lot of room to think. It was quite interactive. You put something into the, our music, i.e. put your attention into it, and you would get something out that wouldn't necessarily be the same thing that the next person got. It was, it was just not literal, it was much more impressionistic. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of the Cocteau Twins, and I think it's because of um, two things. First of all, Robin Guthrie's guitar sound, which until I'd heard that, I don't think I'd heard anything like it before, that sort of shimmering guitar sound that, you know, is, is just obviously so unique to the Cocteau Twins. And then, obviously, Elizabeth's voice, which is pretty unique as well. Of course, Liz, you know, is, I think, most probably one of my favorite singers of all time, you know, and there's something just so otherworldly about her that you can't quite put your finger on. And I don't think she can quite put a finger on, and that's what makes it really brilliant. Yeah, I think because she doesn't actually realise how brilliant she really is. Along the floating ship's oceans I did all my best to smile saw myself as wanting to be a musician but when I first heard their music it just really it just did something to me inside me it was like a gut thing more than a head thing and I just it was almost like falling in love you know when you meet someone you, you, you get like a rush and you sort of you really feel this kind of like engagement with something and that's what it was like really just incredibly beautiful and it you know it didn't sound like anything I think I'd ever really heard before yeah. um, and I think it took a few lessons to really kind of figure out what was going on, you know, and get your head around the fact that they were vocals, but that there weren't actually any you know, words you could really recognise. You know, you might recognise the opera, but yeah, so it, I, I guess I was pretty blown away. The first time I ever heard the Cocteau Twins, I think um, there was a club in Chicago called Medusa's, which was sort of an all-age club, which was really influential to a lot of uh, Chicago music in the 90s because ministry would play there and, and that's where I first heard New Order and stuff like that. And I remember just thinking like, that's so strange, you know? Like it didn't sound like any music that I'd ever heard. I mean, I, I really fell in love with the whole, the, the sound, you know, which kind of like went on. I didn't, I didn't, I mean, it was as much Lizzie's voice as, as Robin's production. The two were just kind of like seamless. And I was always really intrigued as to how, like, they made it sound so effortless. That's what, what attracted me the most. It was kind of, this the first time I'd heard this, you know, I mean, it's described in various ways, I and mean, it's ethereal and like all the other adjectives, but it was really sensuous. It kind of drew you in and was effortless, and you just found yourself just immersed in this sound. And I, um, I, I played the cocktails like relentlessly. I mean, they were, you know, when you get to a period and you just play the same albums over and over again. I mean, I can, I can, I could probably. 
play most of Treasure, and I've never sat down and learned it, but I just I know it so well. In fact, it was the that was the album I played on as I was getting ready for my wedding. I played to myself as I was getting dressed on my wedding day, because it's the most one. Of, it's, the, it's the most romantic sound I've ever heard. A curious beginning, really, because we were very sort of young. Myself and uh, Will Heggy, the first bass player, we'd sort of known each other since we were at school and knew Liz. So when we made Garlands, uh, I mean, I was like 19 and Liz was 17, so we were kind of young. We were kind of uh, really super naive, you know. Well, we'd, we'd, we decided we'd make. Uh, a demo tape and uh, we'd release a record. And we had to play the songs twice, in fact, because we couldn't copy the cassette. And uh, naively jumped on an overnight bus to London and uh, took one to 4ED, handed it in, and took one to the BBC and handed it into John Peel's office and then just went back to Scotland and waited for the response, which we knew would come. Uh, because we thought we were great. And we would just chosen that label and they were the lucky ones. and. It was years, absolutely years, before I realised that that's not how it works. It was really kind of blind, useful, naive stupidity and total self-belief that what we were doing was just great and different and exciting and vibrant. Well, of course, Robin Guthrie was in town in London to see the birthday party played. They'd just come down to, as fans to see the birthday party played and uh, they had a cassette which they stuffed into my hands, or Robin stuffed into my hand, literally just sort of passing him. And that's the first time I ever heard the Cocteau Twins, and the extraordinary thing was that you could barely hear Liz on there. I mean, yes, there's this thin reverb voice behind all of these guitars, and sort of natural tape compression of a thing live to tape was going on. But you couldn't, couldn't hear, but I really liked it, I really liked it, and I invited them to come down to London to record a, a couple of songs. And so I'd never met them until they came, they stayed in my flat, we went to the studio, they set up and they started playing and they started singing and it was quite a surprise. I mean, you know, just talk about icing on the cake. I mean, I was interested in them for, you know, the energy and, and, and the, the melodic aspects of the, of the music, but I had no idea that this voice was, was, was even there. So, yeah, let's say icing on the cake. Why are people so uh, excited about you? Because we're so good. Is that so? Because we're so much yeah. better than everybody else. Because so so many other people are complete rubbish. But people have got to pay attention to us. It's pretty obvious, really. <laughs> something like along the lines of if Nancy Sinatra had Einstein's and Neubau and as a backing band, that's kind of like how we want to sound. And um, yeah, that was it. We wanted to kind of like uh, fuck with the genres, if you know what I mean. People were kind of too happy to stick with a, you know, recognised like rock and roll formula or pop or, and yeah, to us it was like, it's music's music, you know, so use any elements that you, you you can get in there. When I first was hanging out with 
Jen, we were in a band together and William was doing his own thing. So it was like, and Jen made a couple of songs, like Upside Down and Never Understand. And so me and Jim were a group, try to find some other people and then eventually Jim just said, oh, well, William's going to be in the group and brought a whole bunch of other songs. And that was not long before we did our first gig. Yeah, I didn't really want to be the singer, neither, neither did William. And I think what it came down to is that he could play guitar slightly better than I could, which was like he could play guitar hardly at all. But he could just about hold down a bar chord. And we had a gig coming up, so somebody had to do the guitar work, somebody had to sing, you know, and it just kind of happened that way. I tried to get a gig in some club in Glasgow, and the guy didn't want to put the Mary chain on, but he ha happened to know Bobby, he didn't. He said, here, I'll be a Sid Barrett's look for you if you want it. And then Bobby luckily come to tape over and listened to us, and had a name and address and phone number on it, and Bobby phoned us up. said, I've got this mate, Alan McGee, and you want me to send him your demo? And that's, that's the rest is history. Me and Alan were lifelong friends. We're friends since we're mid, you know, teenagers, and I, I'm both into punk rock. I, I sent him the tape. And I said, I think this band are amazing, and um, I knew he, he had a club. We went to do the sound check, and then we we just exploded, and I was screaming at William, and McGee had just walked in. We'd never met him before, and he just walked in and seen these two guys that were. Like sort of going for each other, and then we sort of just plugged in, made this racket, and it must have sounded like I don't know, like freeform jazz music or something like that. But he, he thought it was genius, and he just walked up there and then and going, I love it. I'll do a three album deal with you. And like, who the fuck is this guy? You know what I mean? But there you go. I think the beginning of creation was that uh, we tried to sort of marry kind of like punk rock and psychedelia. That's kind of really what we're trying to do. It was really no more complicated than that, really, to be honest. It was like, you know, we had no idea that it was going to be like a 17 years kind of record label. Was we're going to be like the Beatles, we're going to go to Germany dressed in black, like I'm going to come back, I'm going to be rock and roll stars. That's what he said to me. <laughs> and you know what, it kind of did harm. Because when we come back, up, Alan had released Upside Down, and people were going crazy for it, you know, saying that the Jesus Mary chain on the new Sex Pistols, and it was mad, you know. So we, we, when we left, we, we couldn't get gigs anywhere. And when we come back, you know, getting new sounds, Melody Maker, you know, camera crews from the TV, you know, crazy sold out gigs, riots. It was amazing. Secret of the Mary Chan guitar sound. That's William, really. It's, it's William and Jim, it's what they do. I just put the mics in front of the things, really, and kind of make a few suggestions or whatever. But William, when he puts on that Gretsch with his Shinai pedal and hits the E chord, it's the Mary Chain. Just no one hits an E chord like William Reed. It was like based on their entire sound on that, that fuzz pedal that this bloke down the road sold us for a tenor or something like that. That was it. That was our guitar sound in that pedal. Just to listen to William's guitar every night, and it was. What he was doing was free form. It was different every single night on every song. You know, he would have his basic riffs, but he would change. He was a free form guitar player. He was like a free jazz guitar player. And he would hate me saying that, but you know, he had the freedom and the exploration and the imagination of somebody like John Coltrane. Jim's an incredible singer, although he would, to this day, probably say he still isn't. Uh, William was probably the main inspiration behind that whole scene of bands. Do you know what I mean? You know, you know, even though Kevin Shields made better records than the Mary Chain made, um, Kevin Shields comes from the Mary Chain. Um, it's a pity William was such an unlikable individual.
time. It's hard actually to convey how much um, anger they 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 caused. It was quite extraordinary. You kind of thought, God, I thought people had moved past this. The, the media went crazy with the marriage, and it's like thinking like it was the end of the world. You know, thinking like. But it, they played up to it. They did a really good job. I mean, they had a, a year where it was just um, relentless. I think Psycho Candy is one of the great records of all time. That was such a hugely influential record. I think that was one of those records where everything that came after it seemed to get loud. Because once people heard that, or it was Dinosaur Jr. or whatever, it was like everybody just turned up to some other insane level. I love that record. I listen to it incessantly. And then to actually see them live, it's like that moment, that band is very, like, frozen in my mind. I remember when Psycho Candy came out, it inspired me to make a record that had an identifiable sound. I didn't do it, but I thought, I wish I had a sound like that. As soon as you hear one song, that's Psycho Candy. You know what it is, you know? Um, and, but you can't stay that way, you know? And I don't think a good band can keep putting the same record out over and over again, and they certainly didn't, and they turned into something much different. After Psycho Candy, we, I mean, I don't know, we kind of probably got a little bit too uptight about what to do next. I mean, a lot of people were saying things like, you know, never follow up Psycho Candy, they should split up now because they're going to blow it. A lot of people were talking about the noise, the riots, violence, and we, thought, we sort of thought, well, maybe people should talk more about the songs. So we made a record where people had to talk about the songs because the noise had gone. It was just like you couldn't help but notice that this was an album stuff with good song. In the barren land of the 80s, they were doing something kind of noisy, which was great to hear, but for me, they just got better and better, and I love the Stone Bender Throne, Honey's Dead, and then Monkey, I think, I Hate Rock and Roll, is the greatest rock and roll statement ever, really. I think that's possibly one of the greatest rock and roll songs, you know? William Reed's just really pissed off at everything, singing, I Hate Rock and Roll, and all these people with nowhere to go, you know? I read um, in the papers that you've been described variously as the best new band in, in the uh, Western Hemisphere and also the worst. How do you react to that? Mm -hmm. um, don't fall for it, Moim. He's already asked. He's trying to get you to contradict what you've already said. My favourite colour is gold. Peel was huge. I mean, I was living in East School Bride, signing on the door. You know, hardly anybody knew who we were, and then you switch on the radio, and this guy's like, he's playing a, a session that he's commissioned, and you're like, it's like, you know, what I mean, it's like the, these things don't happen, but it did, you know, and it's just like he was huge, and he did that for so many other bands, you know. What'll happen, of course, is it's always the case that the records that people tell you, it's a, why are you playing that on the radio? Nobody wants to hear that kind of thing. They're the bands who turn up in 10 years, tw 12 years' time with Richard Skinner or somebody doing a kind of, you know, the My Bloody Valentine story, episode 12, The Difficult Years. And you get all that kind of stuff, you know? So, I mean, they now do programmes on, you know, a series of programmes on bands that they told me years ago nobody wanted to listen to. You know, your Pink Floyds and people like that. So I don't pay any attention to that. What does your music reflect? Reflect? I don't know, it's just... I don't, we don't know. It's hard to explain what it reflects, really. It's just... What sort of subjects are you dealing with? Um, you know... I don't know, personal... Uh, confusion. Started and we got the name. It was like a kind of it, it was just our old singer day, and he just said, "What about my Bloody Valentine?" And we sort of smiled and laughed a bit. Well, that sounds pretty funny. And then we just went, "Yeah." And in the, the same conversation, we were like, "Should we leave the country?" And we were all like, "Yeah, that seemed like a good idea." And then six months later, or less, we were gone. I came to play my Bloody Valentine because um, I, an ex-girlfriend of mine. Uh, was a singer in a band in Berlin and the Valentines, they from Ireland initially and they'd gone to Holland and then they ended up in, in Berlin and then they said they were coming back to London and asked her 
if she knew any bass players in London, and she just said yes, get in contact with Deb. They never actually told me I was in the band. It was only when we auditioned Belinda, and I sort of mentioned it to them that, you know, you never actually told me whether I was in or not. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you've been around long enough, you might as well stay. I always loved them right from the beginning. Not everyone did, you know, not even increasingly, but not rated. They didn't get signed till later, and it was almost just like a, it's kind of an afterthought. They, they had to battle, they had to, you know, really push, push it and suffer some quite hard times of all the times, you know. Just a lot of people didn't get it, I don't think. I think they were just too far out of it, really. They seemed to be taking what was was really, I, I guess, a bunch of noisy guitar stuff, but giving it kind of an ethereal, crystalline beauty to it. And a lot of people hadn't done stuff that you would call beautiful music. It's volume. But you turn something up loud enough, and it's all oh, the harmonic frequencies start getting all blurry, and then you hear like these ghost notes and these weird harmonics in the music that you wouldn't hear otherwise. <laughs> stage, for instance, when Kevin Disney made me realise, and he's playing one note for 15 minutes, and he's permeating in, into this thing that morphs and changes. It's one of those things where it was full volume, and for the first three minutes, it's like, oh, okay, this is kind of cool. Then you're like, this is really too much. Like, I wish they'd fucking stop. And then about the seven minutes, it actually became kind of funny. And then about 10 minutes in, you start actually getting into it. It's like, you know, 20 minutes of just psychotic noise, almost unbearable, you know? And then they exploded again back out of the bass drums and the rest. Some people in the crowd would hate it, and after like five minutes, people would become really pissed off. And you know, you know someone would go for that. It's this thing would go for that. And then after like another five minutes, the hand would come down, they slip down, sit down, go back up again. That was like the endurance test. Like, people were already pissed off. They'll stay there, they'd be pissed off you, and they'd go like, we'd hate you, but it's kind of, I keep on watching it because we can't believe you're doing this. We can't believe what we're trying to bring this torture upon us. And a lot of people just love it. something that can invoke a feeling, a place, a vibe, you know, and that's, I get that so much from Valentine's, and like the care that goes into the sound of it. You know, a record that can make you feel like you're high or you're underwater. It was an abstract sense of tension or beauty. And there's few artists, I think, that can really achieve that sort of thing. The sort of sound of things being a bit muffled and a bit kind of that kind of fluff on the needle sound. Things are a bit dull, and it just comes from not. It, it's just how it, it, it mainly stems from the fact that most people have got used to really bright, bright music because that's the kind of music that initially comes across best on radio and TV. And um, when we make records, we don't take any of that into consideration. We haven't yet. Loveless. The moment I heard it, I, I think I listened to it three times in a row. I just stopped everything, and that, I've done that to a handful of albums in my life. I was just completely and utterly blown away by it. I couldn't. It was one of those records that you'd waited so long, you'd gone past the point of even thinking like you can't, it can't possibly be anywhere near as good as everyone thinks it's going to be because it's taken 15 times longer than it should have done. And then it went on even longer, and you thought, ah, oh, it doesn't really matter. I'm not even fussed about hearing it. And yet, the first time I heard it, I thought this is 
so much better than I ever thought it was going to be. It's just like one of those moments where you think, oh, I wish that came around at least once a year, not like once a decade. It's, and there's always been, and it will always be my top ten albums of like of everything I've ever heard in like you know, forty plus, 50, almost fifty years now. It's like it's that big to me. <laughs> Sounds like you're half awake. Sounds like you're just trying to, you know, can't wake up properly. And she said, you know, you need to wake up. You know, you need to wake up. You can't do that anymore. You need to exercise. And she, you know, and so that's a record of somebody who's not awake. Working with Kevin's great fun, actually. I mean, he's a very interesting guy. He's got amazing views on everything, to music, and far beyond that. And he just has this thing where he can hear things that other people can't hear. It takes a certain kind of person to make those kinds of records properly. And the fact that Alan's been the guy that, that worked with the Mary Chain, with the Valentines, with Swerve Driver, it says a lot about Alan's skill to um, be able to separate sound properly. Because the downside of those kind of records is it just gets too crazy. And, and somebody has to sort of make some internal sonic decisions. Mulder was a breath of fresh air. He was into the Mary Chain. He was like, he, I mean, the first thing he said to us was he was a fan. So, you know what I mean? You, didn't really meet too many of them that was involved in the technical side of music, so that, that was fabulous. I like a lot of dense sounds. I like a lot of sounds together. I've always liked that big wall. So I just seem to just enjoy trying to get them all to fit together and capturing what the guitar player does, because they're all so different. We were in some studio in London doing a second single. We make a complete pig's ear of the recording. Alan comes to the rescue and says, I know this guy, he's a scientist, he'll fix it. And this was Alan Mulder, who just worked on Automatic with the Mary Jane. And so uh, Alan comes in, balances all the sound, and his, his line was, he couldn't tell which was the bass drum, which was the snare drum on the track, because it was such a mess, you know? So he fixes it all up, but we have the single out, and then we go, right, you're mixing the album. From then on, he was with us until, I guess, until we lost our minds in 
bizarre thing about it is when I tell the story, because about a third or fourth gig, there was an A&R man there, and he, sat, he was the one who put the word out in London. And then, you know, six gigs later or something, we had a record deal or something. I don't know exactly how fast it was, but it was a bit crazy. It was obviously fast in that a lot of bands work very hard to get to a certain position, you know, and they, and they, they do a few albums before they get recognised, whereas, you know, literally our first, our demo essentially was, was released. Um, so that, you know, that's, um, that's got a lot of good and bad things about it, you know, in terms of establishing yourself as musicians and, and having a, a kind of lifespan in music. You know, we had a feeling in the end, although at first we didn't know what was going on, but in the end I think we felt that we're doing something really interesting and really good here. And for them, people that go on, I think it's like a sort of baton charge, you know, it's like a baton race. And you maybe have the baton at some point and then people come and take it off you and then just keep moving further and further down the line. Those first three EPs that Slow Dive put out, I think are probably, they define that era for, for me. Absolutely beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Tunings and stuff that gave them this very big, big, big sound. And the guitar sounding like big, big keyboard watches. And they used to layer things up very heavily. And uh, so it was that mixed with uh, kind of kind of free, free formness in certain elements of the way they were. But I in particular really liked. In a way, they were the most uncompromising of that batch of bands, because there was never any way that they were going to cross over onto radio, but they didn't seem to care. It was very enjoyable, and, um, you know, I think we made um, some good records, you know. Um, I think 50% of it is good. I think there's some really good stuff to it as well. electronic and uh, more guitar orientated aspects that are coming out of that tradition and I think even to the de degree that on, on the second album for instance like with a lot of the songs you, you'd, you'd have a very hard time categorizing it saying that's an indie record or that's an electronic record um, already and that's that's obviously an approach that I can relate to uh, very much that's something I, I try to do with, with my own music um, as well kind of merging these two um, approaches as, as far as possible. I think it was that they were designed to be listened to quite a few times um, so that you could always hear something new. You know, even if you'd heard it 20, 30 times, you'd always hear something new. And um, I kind of, I suppose that's why we liked having that sort of pop song but then fucked up. Because you, it, it's like you took it apart and, and, and made it less accessible.
places in England, or probably everywhere, was kind of a barren land in, in some ways. You know, Echo and the Bunnymen were pretty cool, or whatever. But you know, a lot of bands were reaching back for something noisier, you know, but not something retro. And I think when we started, we thought this song's a bit dinosaur, this song's a bit Sonic Youth, or whatever. But I guess with time, Swerve Driver had its own sound. I mean, to me, out of all that lot, Swerve Driver, I think, were my favourite because they just sounded, in a mirror chain kind of way, as well, like this American rock band, really. You know, we would take them on tour in the middle America, and their style would totally slot in with an American audience. But a band like Swerve Driver had got no radio play in America. They got some MTV play. And without radio play in America at that time, nobody would know, you know, who you were, really. For me, the, the, the high points of, of being in Pale Saints was always making the music, the excitement of creating a song. Um, before we had a record contract, one of my ambitions was just to make a record. That, that's, it, was, it was as simple as that. I just wanted to make a record. <laughs> had this singer we want to form a band so we started playing together in my kitchen in Ealing but then Mickey we were both at college at the time and she met Chris Ackland at Merrill Barham and Steve Rippon at her college and it, that was when we sort of said oh look, we can you know, actually be a band now and start playing gigs. <laughs> They were playing the same gig. They were playing at the Falcon together, you know. I think it was Falcon Horrible they were playing, sorry. Um, but yeah, I went to see them and I came out of there wanting to work with, with both of them. 
Do you know I just came from a completely different background? I came from a punk background and I think I just enforced my will, you know, on it and just said, this is how it's going to be. Have you heard My Bloody Valentine? Have you heard these bands? And I started to educate him in the music that I was listening to and he just loved it and he just got it totally straight away, which of course he would. They were a good band. I, I thought they were brilliant, do you know what I mean? It was like some of their songs, you know, it's like... All of them. Ride had some good. Everyone had good stuff. Lush, Lush, Emma from Lush had a very unusual original songwriting style. Do you know what I mean? It's like I could say good th a lot of good things about everyone. It just seemed to me like that it was kind of like the 1960s again, where like you know the, the suits at the at the labels didn't have any clue what was happening, and they were signing anything and throwing it against the wall to see what would stick. And we completely got in there and took advantage of that to a huge extent. So I mean, there was lots of good, interesting underground music, and everybody was getting signed for hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you know, it was actually really good. You know. For me, what was the great thing about the scene was that it was very much people were willing to experiment on stage and in the studio, trying to break to some new ground. We had all these guitar effects that had their own minds about what they would do, and you couldn't really control them that much, and we didn't really want to control them. So every time we played, there was this element of experimentation, of fear, and of just this incredible excitement, you know, that we're able to do it. I really think it does come down to, you know, taking traditional instrumentation, um, but not treating it like it's only limited to do these things. You have to use that amp. Like the 70s rock or the Who, Rolling Stones, Beatles kind of bullshit thing that you have these instruments, that's what a rock band is, and you kind of play them this way, and that's the archetype of what all rock music should sound like. Um, I totally disagree with that. And when a band breaks that formula, uh, like Public Image, for example, through to Valentine's, I think that's where it can get really exciting. I think, you know, the whole thing about that movement is, was there, there were a lot of bands that were trying to do something interesting with guitars, you know, where it was, it was sort of breaking away from just the sort of standard way of doing it, which kind of made it really interesting, I think. I didn't sit down and, at any point and think, right, I'm going to make my guitar sound like a synthesizer. I think it was more... The people I'm influenced by, say, Robin Up early on and Kevin Shields, what interested me was the way they used guitars or tried not to use guitars in a traditional way. We just tried to develop a sound that no one had done before, you know, it's the same thing. I, that was the only criteria, really, was like, this really sounds like anybody else who failed, you know. Most of the stuff that I've ever done has been drone-based and has been based on very simple sounds, um, simple groupings of sounds. Um, and it's, that's, you know, basically, ultimately, I'm trying to create a mood with this stuff and it's whatever does that best. The very definition of atmosphere, you're creating a sort of a landscape that's unfamiliar and oftentimes impenetrable. I mean, quote me, quote me four lines of a My Bloody Valentine song. You can't because most of the times you can't even really hear what they're even singing. But that's part of what makes it so fascinating is you're listening in a, in a way that you wouldn't be listening if the vocals were right here and you could hear everything. I always met up all the vocal melodies and when I make up the melodies, kind of sing and just sing unconsciously and it sounds like stuff so a lot of lyrics came from you know what that sounded like and it, you realize it, we realized that it, it made sense it was it's like unconscious talking in a way She's smart, happy just to be
make any issue out of uh, you know the, the women in the bands in Slow Dive and in, in, in uh, My Bloody Valentine, and uh, they were past it already. They were accepted as equals. You know, Deb Gooch was, was in the band because she was a great bass player. Period. You know, she wasn't in the band because she was a great female bass player. It was, I suppose, it was quite a healthy scene in some ways, and also certainly Lush was on a, a label which had a lot of women. You know, not just. You know, it sounded completely different from Lush, you know, but yes, you know, throwing Muses and Kim Deal and even, you know, Heidi Berry or whatever, you know, and probably, I'm be surprised if it had been more women on Heidi than men. It was a very healthy time and period in, in music, and I, I the, 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 the sex of the people um, creating the music, it, it just never occurred to me that there was anything to, to think about. <laughs> Most of the stuff, but I think um, there was a few tracks that we were singing together, and I, I always just loved that kind of sound and, and the way those, those vocals were layered, and, and probably Sonic Youth was a big part of that. But, and also, um, you know, it was my buddy Valentine as well. You know, just um, so I suppose we were just trying to emulate those sort of sounds, but doing it our own. Sort of way. All I noticed in the whole the world that we were in, there seemed to be as many girls around as guys, like in the indie world, if you know what I mean, or whatever. Um, and then that, you know, when Nirvana happened, it just, and, and Britpop happened, Oasis and Blur, it was just a reaffirmation of the old energy. Kevin, he had this whole thing about combining male and female in terms of like, I think the aggression in the music was male, but the melodies and the softness in the vocal was female, and it was merging it, you know? And uh, somewhere in there is the secret of my bloody Valentine, I think. Or not the secret, but the essence, you know? Combining male and female sexuality, or, you know, spirits, or whatever you want to say. I don't know, but that's... Because rock and roll is normally like a real male aggressive thing. I think it's weirder when you... It's weirder when you see things being so male dominated. That's, that seems stranger. I remember with, you know, with people like Dinosaur Jr. and Sonic Youth and My Bloody Valentine and all these, it's like you simply hold your guitar and you turn it up as loud as you can and you try not to look at the audience and you say, we're doing something up here that we're not sure of. It was all kind of anonymous. I mean, we never had our pictures on the record covers or anything so we obviously didn't think it was that important we wanted to sort of concentrate on the music i was always hoping one day i might get to do a single it's my kind of only real driving thing in life going back to the accident of actually doing a single that was my only really driving thing was to do a single or something because i didn't feel like i was the right kind of person um for that, what I wasn't comfortable with was, was the posturing and, the, and the, the rock and roll aspect of it all. And, and the, the, here, was, here was an opportunity to write the songs I wanted, but still have the volume and the excitement and the drama that I wanted without, without necessarily falling into some of the more obvious traps of you know, rock and roll. I was never really interested in what we did on stage because I always thought the music was the only important thing. Because whenever I used to go to a gig, if the music was good enough, I'd close my eyes anyway and I wouldn't see what was going on on the stage. If we'd all been like, you know, real rock and roll animals, then we would have been a different band completely, but that's not what we're like, you know. I think we're all relatively sort of uh, introspective. We were in a band because we wanted to play music. We weren't in a band because we wanted to be famous. The kind of violence, you know, that whole kind of like 20 minute gigs and riot thing, I think that blew over quickly. I think the image that we had was kind of a sullen, that you couldn't really talk to the manager. If you met them, they would, they would just like walk in the other direction or something like that. I think a lot of that came from the fact that we are very shy. I mean, I'm not very comfortable in, in the company of people that I don't really know very well. And I think a lot of people misinterpret that as me being kind of rather stuck up or what have you. I, I just like to keep myself to myself. I do respect that the, the back then it was even less important, but I think that 
Um, that's a social thing as well. I think if you look, you know, look at TV in the early '90s and the way people, the way people look, the way people dressed, it's just, it was um, altogether less self-conscious in general. I think the image was no image. It felt like to me, you know, and that seemed to be kind of a movement then. It didn't seem awkward. Um, I don't think it was completely out of character at that time so much. I mean, I think that's what made it so great. It's like, we want to play rock music. I can, I can think of Dinosaur Jr. and My Bloody Valentine. They're the greatest examples of that. They're saying, we want to play rock music with as much bombast, as much volume, as much skill and all these stuff as, say, a band like Aerosmith. But we don't want to look like these monkeys up there that are looking for something to fuck all the time. We were rubbish at interviews. We really were bad. I mean, we were quite good in the studio. You know, that was where we were all right. That's where we could express ourselves. When it came to articulating it, we hadn't really worked it out. And we just used to uh, kind of freeze up the moment, the moment the red light went on. You know, we kind of like, we'd think it was a battle between them trying to catch us out and ask us tricky questions. So we would just kind of clam up and say nothing. When they would come to interview us or something, they weren't quite sort of prepared for that, you know. They let, let everything on a platter, really. It's just like they, they want to read the, the press release from the record company, rehash that. The thing that really I didn't like at that moment was the English press was so patronising towards uh, uh, myself and Liz, especially because of our Scottish accents. The same thing happened later with the Jesus and Mary chain. Uh, you know, in the way that they write down, you know, what you're trying to say, but they write it down with, oh, I didn't can, Jimmy. <laughs> you know, this sort of like phony sort of Scottish talk, you know, and it sort of, it really belittles the Scottish people. Let's face it, if you read something like that, it, it makes you feel like less intelligent or something, or, or you know, or I'm, I'm unable to understand what these people are saying, you know, I, I just find it so patronising, it's, it's a big turn off, and that was one of the reasons why after, after a while we just didn't bother doing interviews anymore, because it's just like, well, after, you know, these people just don't get it at all. An interview, just when Loveless came out, I said we're talking about years before people will even begin to talk about this record on the level that I'm hearing it. And everyone was like, that's really arrogant. And yet at the time, it's, in retrospect, it, it, I thought I was right, but I wasn't wrong either. You know what I mean? Um, um, what I mean is, what I'm trying to say is that, funnily enough, we're written about in a much more accurate way now than at the time when it was just Underwater guitars, millions of overdubs, mumble vocals. It was just I don't know, mostly wrong. You know what I mean? They were they weren't really true. The press kind of took us by surprise. We started off in a garage and um, ended up with everybody's writing about you every week, and so we we didn't take it too seriously. It was all more about what happens in the rehearsal rooms and in the studios and between us as people and stuff. Um, uh, but yeah, we got a fair share of backlash as well. We got a fair share of that. Well, pro possibly not as much as some. At that time, everyone seemed to like each other. Everyone seemed to like being supportive of other bands and name check other bands, which was a bizarre period in musical history. I'm sure the NME really hated it, but because there wasn't really the slagging contest that you got, like with you know, that you get with other bands that you get now, where everyone's backbiting. But I think the enemy got what they wanted in the end. You know, we were genuinely friends with Chaps House. We'd sort of grown up with them and set, you know, because they were from Reading, we're from Reading. And, and Ryan were from Oxford, so we, we kind of got to know them pretty early on. And, um, and, and yeah, and the bands did hang out together and they did talk together a lot. When, when the press inevitably kind of clumped it all together, I think everyone was probably trying to sort of distance themselves from one another and inevitably it meant that in some ways tensions were created that didn't need to exist in the first place. There is always an element with UK press of the, you know, they'll, they'll big you up massively and then kill you. They were close friends with each other, they were very middle class kids, which, you know, it's kind of, was always a you know, knocking kind of thing in the UK, that, you know, that element of class kind of thing. A lot of people really, um, I suppose, were 
kind of trying to be above the press as well, even though the press was massively important, actually. It was the lifeline of a lot of these bands because they weren't selling. I mean, Ride did sell. They did Top of the Pops. I saw them do it a few times, and they did sell, and the, maybe the, you know, the more kind of um, commercial end of it. But I can't actually remember reading the some of the you know, ride a wimpy kind of things, but, you know, it's it's ironic now when you look back with, it, with you know, hindsight and you go, shit, well, that is a load of bollocks, you know. The sadness is that when the real thing doesn't ever kind of break out of that, the, like the, the constructs of it, of, of the scene, that you kind of think, I wish, you know, like in that case, like the, that the British public would like, embrace these bands, but for a, for a brief period, when it was a new thing, as ever in those days, the music press in particular got behind it, and to a certain degree, that like the you know, the tabloid press, and kind of pushed certain people, and then they tired of it. And you're in the middle of an effortless rise. You don't think you have to change anything to keep figure to keep going. You know, you just think, well, we just keep we're doing exactly what we want. No one's telling us what should be the single. No one's telling us. Um, anything. We're just choosing what we put out, when, what the sleeve looks like, when we tour, what gigs we do. It's all down to us, so let's just keep doing that. And, um, you know, God bless Dave Newton, our manager, for, let, for, for being the one to facilitate all that, but it was a dreadful mistake in one way, because as soon as we, you know, for the same reason that we succeeded, we also failed. It's really, really awful, because if they had had the four of them pulling in the same direction, they would have gone on to conquer the world, I think, because they had such great songs. I mean, instantly memorable songs like Vapor Trail. I mean, it's one of the, it's one of the best kind of 15 second intros of all time. First you look so strong, then you fight. I remember feeling that we were playing in the World Albert Hall and it was the first time that, maybe I'd thought about it before, but I remember looking at people in the audience and sort of feeling that maybe they actually now know that something's kind of not right. You know I mean, and it was just, I mean, the gig was good and everything, but I could just then, it was that sort of time that I could see that, that this wasn't going to last forever. Well, we, we had some really tough times um, had over a year or two, 92 to 94. I mean, we had a lot of rows, and we had a lot of uh, just times when I thought that I, I was going to walk out or he was going to walk out. Um, but then, when it actually happened, it was a, it was a big surprise um, because we were we were part way through making an album, and it was an album that I, I thought was going really well. But we were going to have a completely normal like get together, we all had to sign some lawyers' papers, so we're gonna meet at Dave's house to do that. In this run of the mill kind of meeting, Mark kinda of says, Oh Mark, I can't sign that paper because um well, I can't sign it and Dave was like, well, why can't you sign it? And he said, Well actually I'm leaving. There was a, a a choice of shall we go on or shall we not? Um and um I, I remember very clearly saying that we shouldn't because um it was a kind of all or nothing and we're either all in this or we're not and if, if if somebody's leaving, then I don't think it should carry on. Everything just kind of started moving. You know, it was kind of the curve was a little bit that way, and then at a certain point, you, you kind of felt, okay, this is this is going to stop sometime soon. Going into into Big Mary, and that was definitely uh, you knew this was that that was it. I think the tour that really did it for us was that last tour we did, which was with the Goo Goo Dolls and the Jim Blossoms, and we were going on at like half seven when the doors opened and. Even our fans were going, what are you doing? And, and I, I know, as we were like, I know, we don't want to be here, you know, and that's when you just think, you know. What they were doing sonically 
uh, was disregarded in favour of something really crude and uh, retro and uh, unimaginative. The, the things that came came in their wake, you know, like like the Britpop. You know, there was a couple of good records from the Britpop era, but most of it was was awful. Um, and I felt like there was something progressive and you know um, modern and unpretentious. Um, it wasn't about image. It was basically it had all boxes ticked, and then it was more or less disregarded by the by the press very very quickly. It went from you know uh, you know the default to something you weren't allowed to like. It was just a mess at the end. It was just a real mess, and uh, you know, and I really honestly believe that you know, it could have been not a mess had there not been an awful lot of pressure. My memory of it was a difficult time for everybody because it was that weird moment where, you know, they were sort of on the verge of success. They were actually sort of breaking through on some level as high as you could break through, say, at that time in the early '90s. Um, but you know the personal stuff. So it was like that weird thing where they were actually their dreams were sort of coming true publicly and privately. Things were sort of falling apart. When we went to the big corporations, uh, it all went horribly wrong. You know, we kind of tried to put our foot down and say, no, you're not going to fuck with us. You know, we're going to do exactly what we want to do, and um, which is quite right. But of course, it had the effect of alienating everyone that worked in the company. If if somebody had had the wisdom just to say. This band is just imploding. Let's just leave them alone for six months or let them take a holiday or let them have a break or let them just do their shit and, you know, fight and get over it or whatever. But it wasn't like that. It was just like, we need another two songs by next Thursday, you know, get in the studio, you got to do it. You know, I mean, with the Mary Chain, the Mary Chain story, it was never boring, you know what I mean? We didn't just, like, fizzle out, you know, we, we went out with, with a bang, you know? Uh, it's sad, it's my life, you know, and that, 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 those are painful memories. I mean, we, that's my brother, and we couldn't stand each other at that time. Something that was very different about the Mary Chain was that, you know, lots of bands, you know, like New Order, The Clash, wouldn't do Top of the Pops. We always wanted success on that level, I guess, in the kind of broader, you know, popular level because most of our influences were those kind of things. Okay, we loved the Velvet Underground and Toy Division, but we also loved, you know, the Ronettes and the Spectre thing. So we always wanted that kind of success. But beyond that, to play the game of the entertainment world, apart from, we weren't interested at or we weren't even capable of it. It was almost like the mainstream were kind of pushed into the wilderness, if you like. You know, we didn't play the game. People kind of like were, were happy to get rid of us, and I, around about that time, I felt as if that we were, you know, just like nobody was into us, like very underappreciated. Well, we moved here basically because it's horrible. 
And like, how can a band come in and ask you for a hundred thousand pounds when you live in a horrible place like Hackney? Does it work? Oh yeah, you pay them two and sixpence and they sign for twenty-two years. I like Alan McGee as a human being, but as a record company guy, he was absolutely bloody awful. Do you know what I mean? He fucked everything around. We never had any money. We never had any resources. I don't think I enjoyed creation to be honest. I think it was like it's a bit too it's a bit too student for me. Too student rock. Do you know what I mean? You know, it was a bit I mean, all the kind of people involved in it were all like kind of fucking students, you know. And then all like, you know, like, you know, degrees in fucking philosophy and bollocks. It's just, it wasn't really where I get any music. You never knew what the fuck was happening from one move from one direction to the next. It always was a year behind where we were moving for six months and um so very quickly I was perceived as difficult because I wasn't capitalising on anything. I mean Kevin was Kevin sort of believed his own hype really to be honest, you know, that kinda of like it was it was kinda of sad really, you know what I mean, you know, because it was like the papers were telling him that you know, that he was going to give to music. When he realised what it was, he got very very into it. And we came to the studio in January. We didn't really like him being around. And then we did another session in April. And then we were like, you know what? You can't come to the studio anymore. You actually totally killed him in the mood. You know what I mean? All you talk about is has to be the big, biggest thing. It's all about bigness and best. And, and, and so he was banned from the studio. And then when we started Loveless in September of 89, they were already crazy, were banned. And that's when they were already the relationship was got me you know, in trouble so only way only thing we could have done to keep them happy was to make a record really quick and cheap and then sell loads of copies but we didn't people were talking about it as if it was like Beethoven's set you know at seventh or eighth symphony it's about like no it's just some guy that can't even finish a record that took three years we finished he came down and listened to loveless in the studio and went it sounds like a very expensive record that's all pretty much his only comment and um put it out and he had nothing to do with it, he didn't promote it, did nothing, and that was it. Fucking Loveless. Loveless is just fucking overrated, man, you know, at the end of the day. I put it out. <laughs> it's fucking overrated as fuck. He remembers it, and plus he was a massive cokehead. So he had no, he was totally on drugs and couldn't control it, and everyone liked it. And so his emotional scar from that is huge. I can barely listen to it because I hated the cunt so much. It was like, you know. Yeah, the last thing I heard was that that Kevin had said something about Alan McGee in the press. So Alan McGee decided to let Kevin go. So he just, he just gave them up. So then they were free agents. They weren't signed to Creation anymore. And then the last I heard, they'd signed to Island Records for quite a bit of money and then there was silence. You know, it's like you sort of just believe in this thing and you go along kind of believing in this thing um, and it, takes on its own life and nobody nobody's sort of big enough to kind of control it in a way. So yeah, we, we were absolutely we were completely dysfunctional as a as a band, as people. And and it got worse after Loveless. I mean after Loveless we signed to Ireland and we built our own studio, didn't do anything and went completely and absolutely able. I got possessed by something and that kind of made me do everything for a while, basically. And um, that was it. And then it disappeared. And then that was that. It just imploded. We just kind of went a little crazy in ourselves. <laughs> we lost it a bit, you know. It's, we all admit that we actually, you know, we went a little nuts, you know. We just, we, you know, were just, you know, gotten very uh, psychedelic in ourselves, in our minds. We had a psychedelic meltdown, pretty much. We never had the normal management structure. We never had norm, any normal relationship with the music business, and um, and we weren't strong enough for that. We didn't have we didn't have the in, the internal strength to do that. So by about ninety four, it had all just totally like like just crashed. You know what I mean? And by ninety five, the band split. And um, but you know we we. What we hadn't lost is um, we had no energy, do you know what I mean, and no momentum. But the ideas didn't disappear.
musically, we were all a little bit ahead of our time, and and there wasn't really a, a place, there wasn't really a niche. The niche was being was being carved by bands like Ride and Slow Dive, but they weren't given a chance. I think it's not important to sell a lot of CDs if you are sure that you are making good music and interesting music. And um, <coughs> there is a lot of bands from the, the 80s and the 90s who does not sell a lot of records, but the music are so important for the music cultures and for the history of music that we don't care of selling a lot of records. I mean, it's hard to say if you base success on purely on record sales, then you'd have to say they didn't live up to their potential. If you'd base success on what people that love music and care about music think, unquestionably, I'd say they're a success. If you base it on influence, then far and wide they're a success. I see our name in reviews in like Rolling Stone and they say this band sounds a bit like Swerve Driver, so I guess that means Swerve Driver had their own sound to a degree, you know. And, uh, you know, I guess there is a kind of resurgence, isn't there, supposedly, of uh, bands of this ilk, you know. I, well, I don't think it's it's been continuous. I think it was completely, absolutely not there at all for 10 years. It seems to be sort of happening again over the last couple of years. It doesn't surprise I mean, I just think things are circular. Things are kind of cyclical, you know. There's bands that sort of preempted us, like the Pixies, for instance, who were a couple of years before us reforming. And it's just like you can just sort of see it coming back, you know. I meet kids every once in a while, and I'm always shocked. You know, how old are you? 20 years old. What are you into? Oh, we're into ride. We're into, you know, slow dive. It's like, oh, awesome. You like that stuff, you know. And I talk to them about seeing those bands and stuff like that. So I'm, it's, I'm totally jazzed up that there's a new group of kids coming that are, are totally into these bands, just like I was into, you know, the Velvet Underground or something. And so it makes me excited. Sad thing if like the mainstream was totally forgotten. I mean, uh, I mean, I love that. I mean, if someone says that they, they they're making records, at least in, in part because they've heard a mainstream record, that's it's one of the best compliments anybody could pay you. I think, you know. I mean, that is what it's all about. You want to be one of those bands that makes other people want to pick up a guitar, because not every band's like that. There's some bands that's just all they're doing is they're entertaining you for the, the five minutes that they exist. Well, just much. I mean, it's a very, very rich history. It's a rich story. You know, uh, it's, it's not really one that's ever been sort of told. It's never, there's never been a book about this band or anything like that. There's so much, uh, there's so many stories to be told. And there's so many experiences, I think. You know, I, mean, I guess it's the same for any band, but I mean, I think that we, you know, had, you know, had a lot of fun as well, you know, and a lot of difficulties, but we made something that really kind of lasted. The world, it's gone through a horribly macho phase recently, do you know what I mean? Basically bomb, explode and, you know, kill. And then, um, 
and I'm or force using fear and force. You know what I mean? That's plus other, other th anything else. And but it's just like it's it, it, then it runs out of steam. Maybe that's why my buddy Valentine disappeared and it's only starting up again. Because we disappeared exactly when our time was. There was no energy for us, and then now it's coming back. I think it was a moment. I mean, it was a moment as there so often is in, in popular music, where for a year or two, something sort of coalesces, a movement coalesces, uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, out of the same city or out of the same club, but a group of people who are responding to the same stimulus, you know, come up with something that can be, uh, you know, quantified as, as a genre, if you like. And that moment shifts and, and, and changes. It's, to me, that period in time was, you know, the last golden era in music, really. And I really do believe that. I think the wonderful thing about a lot of these bands is that they made music that's sort of has a timeless appeal. And the great thing about the internet world that we're entering into is that people are going to find these bands now. And the quality level of these bands is really, really high. So it's the type of music where 40, 50 years from now, you'd hear a song and you'd still be interested. Culturally, it was one of the most successful movements of the last 40 years. I mean, it had a huge, and, and still has, a huge impact on what, if you are in love with music, what people do now, they, they will refer back to groups of, of this era. So, I mean, in, in, in a more fundamental way, they were hugely successful. If they'd all just gone after the number one slot, there wouldn't have been a movement and there wouldn't have been the music to talk about. You can't remember who was number one when Loveless came out, but you can remember when Loveless came out. So that's the difference. I mean, success is measured, uh, for me, probably in a different way.